Live from Studio 2 at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Scarlett Fo. And I'm Alex Steele. And to point out, this has been eight or nine years in the making. We is used to have a show together around this time, and now we're doing it again. Is it 2015 all over again? Is that what it was? Yeah. It was so long. But remember now we're the name back. of the show? What did you, you miss something? Yeah, what'd you miss? Oh, what'd you miss? All right, anyway, let's get a check in on the markets because I gotta tell you, equities are tremendously boring. So as we count you down to the close, pretty much ignore the index level and volume is also terrifically light. Uh, NASDAQ 100, kind of the same thing. A little heavier though, down by three uh, tenths of 1%. I did want to point out the two year in particular, up by six basis points, seeing the the the, the most buying there uh, along the curve, I mean down by six basis points, most across the curve. You had a nice takedown of the three year auction. We get that 10 year auction today as well. You also got continued Fed speak about pushing out that cut uh, later and later. Not there yet. Not there yet. That message really trying to sink home here in the Bloomberg dollar index. Just watch the 200 day moving average. We had a nice run over the last couple days. We're pausing here really close to that 200 day, Scarlett. Well, Alex, you mentioned Fed speak. It's certainly helping to soothe the bond market. While stocks have settled into a pretty tight range, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Messer said policymakers will likely gain confidence to cut rates later this year. Since there's no economic data on the calendar today. What it means is investors are left searching for direction. They're counting on earnings and Fed commentary to provide cues. Meantime, regulators are taking aim at hedge funds. The SEC is set to label prop trading firms that regularly trade treasuries as dealers because they're increasingly responsible for liquidity in this massive market. Now, doing so would mean more guardrails that would lead to increased scrutiny and higher compliance costs, all of that. As for company news, Boeing is in the spotlight today. The fallout from its 737 MAX mid-air blowout last month has made it the worst performer in the Dow Industrials this year. Alex down almost 20%. What's the latest on Boeing? The headlines, right? They just keep on coming. The latest is the NTSB saying that Alaska Air Boeing MAX 9 door plug was missing bolts. I kind of thought we knew that, but still, when you get these headlines that just continue, uh, that's pretty rough going. Also, Spirit Aerosystems uh, did have its earnings call. They didn't provide guidance. Because of that, they get the majority of their revenue uh, from Boeing. And here is really why it matters. This is a fantastic chart. Thank you, Brooke Sutherland, a Bloomberg opinion. Uh, the blue is operating income for Boeing, and the white is operating income for commercial airplanes. And they just, I mean, you got to squint, but they just got that into positive territory. About $283 million of total operating income and $41 million for uh, commercial planes. Now, unless you can deliver the planes, then you can't get the money, and then that operating income gets harder and harder to come by. That's why it's so important. Now, this also became an issue in D.C. today. You had FAA Administrator Mike Whitaker testifying to the House Transportation Committee earlier today, vowing to hold Boeing accountable for those quality lapses. The events of, of January 5th, it, it really created two issues for us. One, what's wrong with this airplane? Uh, but two, what's going on with the production uh, at Boeing. And there have been issues in the past, and they don't seem to be getting resolved. So we feel like we need to have a heightened level of oversight. Mike Whitaker, the FAA administrator there. Now let's get some more perspective on this hearing and Boeing's issues overall from Stan Sorcher. He is a former Boeing engineer who worked at the company for nearly 20 years. He's also a policy advisor for the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers Labor Union. Stan, so good to speak with you. Uh, just some more headlines out of Boeing uh, right now. Uh, the company saying added scrutiny will make us better and uh, the CEO Dave Calhoun making clear that Boeing is accountable for what happened and it is implementing plans to improve 737 production quality. It is cooperating with all the agencies and the probes as well. Stan, Mike Whitaker posed an important question at the hearing today, which is what is going on with production at Boeing? And one answer that comes up a lot is culture. So briefly tell us what you saw at your two decades in Boeing. Uh, what was the culture like when you started there in 1980? What was it like when you left? Um, yeah, this, uh, so I, uh, I had um, a great job at Boeing that I had um, a visibility for uh, a, a lot of the uh, functions and the work that, that was going on at Boeing. Um, I was quite surprised to see how social engineers were. Um, I'd never seen such a high level of communication and coordination and trust and willingness to sacrifice your individual interests for the success of the program. It, it was not only fascinating, it was extraordinarily productive. And uh, so to me, that was, that was the uh, strength of um, uh, the engineering problem-solving culture. I, 
I also saw it in the manufacturing areas. I, I wasn't out there as, uh, as much as in, in the engineering. But um, again, uh, each, each airplane program had its own culture, uh, which you know, reinforced this problem solving uh, to a greater and lesser degree. Um, uh, I also had uh, the opportunity to see that culture uh, displaced and mm -hmm. uh, replaced with the current uh, cost-cutting um, uh, business model, which yeah. had a completely different workplace culture. So, um, you know, I, I understand, um, you know, Whitaker's question. It's an excellent question. Uh, to me, the framework uh, that I, um, I use to, uh, to analyze that is, you know, what is the problem solving culture? It, 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 are you encouraged to solve problems? Yeah. So to that point, um, will an FAA individuals or those that work for Boeing but report to the FAA, having them on the floor, does that solve that problem of, uh, of culture that you're just de defining? Yeah, the relationship with the FAA was part of the problem solving culture that I saw before. And it was, it was on a technical level. The, um, uh, Boeing certification engineers and the FAA certification engineers had uh, a technical relationship. Mm -hmm. Over time, uh, that changed a lot. Uh, any any way to strengthen that connection between uh, uh, the Boeing employees and uh, the FAA oversight would be a good thing. And um, uh, uh, that that connection had uh, deteriorated uh, yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and so it was very difficult for the FAA to keep up. So Stan, another development that's happened today, as I'm sure you know, is that um, Boeing's largest union is now demanding a pay increase. They're inspired by the UAW and the Hollywood writers and actors strike. Uh, you worked with uh, a union representing company engineers during your time at the company. Given the pressure Boeing is under, how much of an upper hand does the union have right now, would you say? Uh, that, um, uh, that, that's, I guess we'll see, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, it, another question is, which way is Boeing going to go in the future? Are they going to stick with this uh, cost-cutting um, uh, business approach, or are they going to have more of an engaged, empowered uh, workforce? And, um, uh, you know, that ultimately uh, comes around into uh, compensation and benefits yeah. and the work environment. All right, Stan, really got to really appreciate your joining us and sharing your insight. We got to leave it there. Stan Sorcher is a former Boeing engineer, policy advisor for the IFPTE. Coming up on the close, excitement building for the Super Bowl in five days as the Chiefs and the 49ers prepare for a rematch of their 2020 game. The president of the Chiefs joins us. All right, this is football, right? Yes, it football. is. All right, plus shares of DocuSign taking a leg lower, even after the firm announcing it's cutting 6% of its workforce. Martin, what's dragging the stock lower? It's our stock of the hour. And fresh slate of earnings on deck. We've got Ford, we've got Chipotle, Snap, and a lot more. We're going to have breaking analysis on all of that coming up in the 4 p.m. hour. This is The Close on Bloomberg. But in the last six weeks of the year, we announced six deals across the U.S. and Europe, many in sectors we like, digital marketplaces, enterprise software, energy transition, and in real estate, we also saw a pickup in activity, privatizations, a big distressed loan portfolio. So we are seeing a pickup. It does often take a bit of time, but things are starting to loosen. So it does feel like for M&A, a bit of an inflection point. That was Blackstone President John Gray weighing in with his expectations for deals, and we've seen a bit of a comeback for activity this year. Now, Bain is out with its own global M&A report. The firm writing, quote, this year, buyers have their eyes on a growing backlog of deals, adding that as interest rates stabilize, we expect the logjam in M&A markets to break, and when it does, competition for assets will be significant. I want to bring in one of the authors of the report, Suzanne Kumar, a global practice vice president of M&A and divestitures, and our own Nina Trentman, who helps lead Bloomberg's deal coverage uh, for us. Suzanne, let's start with you. Um, when does this happen? When do we get the flurry? <laughs> well, this backlog has been building for a while. Last year, the only thing that buyers and sellers seemed to agree on was that they didn't agree on price. And so it was happening uh, two years of a market decline and declining valuations. Buyers were looking for a bit of a deal. 
sellers didn't want to uh, sell in that environment, and so they're holding on to assets wherever they can. So, Nina, you cover deals for Bloomberg News. Um, you talk to a lot of CFOs, a lot of CEOs. What are you hearing from them when it comes to the, the urgency to make deals? I'm certainly hearing that people are more optimistic this year than they were last year, um, talking to that backlog that you pointed out, um, Suzanne. Um, what I'm certainly hearing from people is um, interest to do deals, um, to basically add to the portfolio, to um, add gaps that comp companies might be having, specifically in AI, in technology. Um, what we are also hearing is people being concerned about regulatory issues. Yeah. So that comes up in many of the conversations. And therefore, many of the companies also saying, well, maybe we'll do tuck in or a smaller acquisition to, to avoid some of those hurdles. So these aren't like transformative mega deals. Like we, we saw some of that in the oil patch, but like that's not what we're really looking at. Well, I think, of course, it's hard to forecast most of the year, but I think so far what we've seen this year, we've seen more um, these these kind of smaller deals. Um, we saw a few pharmaceutical deals in, in recent days whereby um, companies specifically acquired a, a, a type of therapy or a medication instead of just buying like a whole a whole big company. Nina mentioned AI, and that's something mm -hmm. that M&A dealmakers are starting to incorporate in their process. How are they using it, Suzanne? Yeah, so it's, it's the early days, but it's really exciting. Um, a, a small portion of early adopters are using Gen AI for sourcing, screening, and diligencing deals. That makes sense because there's a lot of outside in data that Gen AI can help synthesize and summarize. Mm -hmm. um, the real question is going to be as Gen AI really becomes part of how we all do business in our, in our daily life, can deal makers use Gen AI? to get a competitive advantage, to get find a target that no one else can see, can a differentiated insight on a, on a target, and ultimately better outcomes in their deal making. So that's what we're really going to be paying attention to as so it's, this matures. It's multi-pronged. It's like using uh, generative AI to help find the right deals, mm -hmm. and then it may be also merging within that sector to begin with. Right. Um, where are you seeing the bid-ask spread come in the most? Is there a particular sector? Well, one place that it really was evident in the past year has been in technology. So two years ago, 2021, um, the median deal valuation was at 25 times. It was down to 13 to 15 in the past 18 months. Wow. And so in that environment, you're not surprised to see again that sellers are kind of waiting out. They remember the, those days of high valuations and buyers aren't really willing to to come to the table if that's uh, what, what, what the sellers are expecting. You talk about technology. Healthcare is often set in the same breath as technology because it has that growth aspect to it. Nina, what are you hearing about uh, from the tech firms when it comes to biotech, which relies on a lot of M&A? Well, we've seen a few deals come to market already this year. I think it's interesting to point out that if we just look at the volume of deals that were announced this year, that we're already at, I think, sort of roughly 212 billion um, involving U.S. companies, which is up 76 percent um, compared to the prior year period. I guess that tells us that there is interest from from corporates and also. It's not just the technology side, of course, um, but also interest rates, for example. So companies are expecting interest rates to come down this year. So if you can raise debt more cheaply to fund your deal, that might also be a positive. So it sounds as if there's quite a few positive signals there. On, on the other side, um, do you expect this now to be an exit market for like private equity or VCs or something? Like, Will that part of the market open up? Well, um, the one thing that I can observe is that there, you know, more than half of portfolio companies have now been held for more than four years, so kind of pre-COVID era. And just from a fund economics perspective, they do need to get to market. Uh, so we're going to be looking for some momentum there as well. Suzanne, really appreciate your joining us today and sharing yeah. the results of your survey. Global Practice Vice President for M&A and Divestitures over at Bain. And thank you as well to our very own Nina Trentman, who covers deals. <laughs> Coming up on The Close, Spotify's focus on financial discipline playing out well for the streaming giant. We're going to give you a recap of the fourth quarter performance next. This is The Close. It's time now for our top calls, where we take a look at some of the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And let's start with Tesla, a downgrade to neutral from outperform over at Daiwa Securities. Investors anxious about governance at the Elon Musk 
Elon Musk run company and analysts expect things to get more volatile with Tesla facing tough financial conditions. The stock nevertheless up 2% right now. Next up, United Parcel Service raised a buy from neutral at UBS. The price target set at $175. UPS recently cut thousands of manager roles and the analyst expects this commitment to cost reduction to support margin expansion and profit growth. The shares are up almost 4.5%. Finally, an upgrade for Palantir. Jeffrey is lifting his rating to hold from underperform after the software company posted a strong fourth quarter. Analyst Brent Phil says the quarter was driven by backlog and its U.S. commercial business. The upgrade also reflects his interest in Palantir's, what else, AI platform. The shares up by more than 30% on the day. And those are some of your top calls. Let's take a look now at Spotify. Its appeal is showing no signs of slowing down. The music and audio streaming service posted its second largest monthly active user gain for the fourth quarter, jumping to 602 million listeners. Joining us now to talk through the earnings report is Michael Morris, Senior Managing Director at Guggenheim, who has a buy rating on the shares. Michael, so much of the story about Spotify has been driven by cost controls and restructuring. Have we turned the tide to go back towards the growth story? Well, I think it is a growth story, even in the context of the cost cutting. Um, When you listen to CEO Daniel Ek talk about the business and the progress that he's made at the business over the last 12 months, he's focused on both being disciplined on the cost side, but he was very clear today that this isn't sacrificing growth. When you look at the top line, the top line did accelerate throughout the year on a constant currency basis, hitting 20 percent growth in the fourth quarter. That's being fueled by price increases. And I think there's really more to come both on the top line as well as on the cost discipline side. I mean, Michael, you look at the stock performance. It's been recently just tremendous. Um, It has 52 week high today. Uh, It's just sort of at the top of that range. How much more upside can you actually attribute to that kind of growth that you're talking about? Well, we are in the process of evaluating our model right now and what our price target will be following what we've learned today and the filing. So I want to be clear about that. But I can talk conceptually about what's going on here. And there are a couple of things. Number one, we believe the company continues to have tremendous amount of pricing power with the consumer going forward. The music industry at large has been a a real success story in terms of going from a traditional media industry that was really struggling to one that really has had a lot of growth in a streaming environment. And despite all the growth that they've had with the consumer, they really haven't taken much price. The price increase that Spotify implemented last year was really its first sizable and global, uh, you know, relatively global increase ever. Mm -hmm. That's over the course of over 10 years. So we think you will see more of this pricing growth power going forward for them. And that's the type of thing that's not in the model yet. And I think can really lift uh, the investor's perception of the value here. Yes, but from the consumer perspective, if there are going to be more price increases, uh, the listener wants to get more for their money. What other new program initiatives is Spotify likely to roll out in the next couple of years to justify that price increase? Yeah, it's a it's a great and it's a fair question. I'd, I'd, I'd comment on a couple of things. First of all, um, there are several major audio players in the marketplace right now. Spotify is the largest and I would argue the best in class player, but Apple, Amazon um, and Google all have Uh, strong audio streaming services. But across the board, nobody has really taken price in a while. So um, you are seeing those price increases uh, across each of those players. And really, I mean, the consumer has been getting a great deal. So I want to start with that. It's all the world's music at your fingertips for an ARPU, an average cost to the user of under $5 a month. Uh, It's a great deal. But I also think that the company is enhancing their service. They've added things like podcasts. They've layered in audio books. They've improved the audio quality. Uh, They've added uh, AI technology to help with music discovery and, and DJ and things like that. So there are definitely enhancements made to the service over that time frame as well. The final thing I would point out is we are close to having some regulatory changes in Europe. Hmm. Uh, It is unclear the extent of those changes, but I do believe that those changes, if implemented in the way Spotify envisions them, could free up the app uh, to have even more 
commerce on the platform and more functionality for both artists and users. It's something to get excited about uh, over the course of the next year. Wait, wait, European regulation being taken off to help support a company? Dude, that's weird. That's not what normally happens when it comes to Europe. This is an anomaly. Um, Scar, are you, a, are you a Spotify user? I am a Spotify user, but, you know, uh, as Michael was talking about uh, music discovery, I don't really discover new music. I just kind of rediscover old songs that I used to listen to back in my, my youth. Your youth, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm discovering Taylor Swift because of my nine-year-old daughter. But, but Michael, I ask because I, I wonder, like, can you have, I mean, it's with all the streamers, really. Is there going to be at some point saturation where you're not going to have all the services? You're going to have to really pick and choose, particularly as these guys start to take price. Well, you're not going to have all the services and there will be saturation. So I want to be clear about both of those things. And we look at the video industry as well. And you see dynamics for businesses like Netflix and other streamers on the video side. And you see some parallels and you see some differences. OK, so there's a finite number of people in the world. At some point, they all have the streamer that they want. We understand that. Uh, in the case of music, I don't think that you're anywhere close to that saturation yet, first of all. And second of all, um, I do think people do only take one service, okay, So that and when it comes to music. So that makes it a little bit different, right? Mm -hmm. Spotify, like I said, I do believe that they are best in class, um, and I do believe that they continue to invest in making that functionality better. And one of the great things about it is when you think about the network effect of it, if I have Spotify, you have Spotify, we share our playlist, mm -hmm. uh, it's more of a social, has a social element to it that gets difficult to peel yourself away from once you're already in there. And so that's part of what we think supports the pricing power for this particular service. Uh, and like I said, we see a lot of opportunity for the company ahead. Who is Spotify's biggest competitor right now, Michael? Apple, Apple Music is, is probably the biggest competitor. Um, and it's interesting because uh, I talked about the regulatory environment in Europe and, and kind of joked about uh, how it's typically not a tailwind for businesses. But this is really about uh, companies like Apple that have a, a very strong hold of a number of elements of the app economy, mm -hmm. uh, the hardware, the, the, um, the store, the operating system, and sort of exercising a certain amount of economic power when they have that structural power. Uh, the, the, you know, the regulation uh, in theory is designed to help uh, create a freer market dynamic. And that freer market dynamic would allow a business like Spotify, as I mentioned before, to have some more commerce on the platform. So when you talk about the big companies like Apple and others, they have so many different parts of the ecosystem that they can exercise control over. It is challenging for, for uh, a smaller business. It's kind of hard to say that for a company like Spotify, but a smaller business to achieve some of the things that they want. Yeah. Uh, and we'll see. But hopefully that's the kind of thing that will unfold uh, going forward. Smaller on a relative basis. We, we, can, we can put it that way. Uh, hey, Michael, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Michael Morris over at Guggenheim Securities. I finally had to succumb to the iTunes thing because my daughter's a huge Taylor Swift fan and yeah. I, I have nothing. So in the car for four hours, I'm like, sure, I'll throw some money at that problem. Here's your Taylor Swift. And Madonna. Her second favorite artist is Madonna. Wow, she like bridges a different generation. I know, I right? And she was stunned that her mother like knew Madonna and like had been to her concerts. You taught her well. She was like, what? You know Madonna, mom? <laughs> Maybe not so much she likes Madonna anymore. Yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> All right, coming up, excitement is building for the Super Bowl in just five days. The Kansas City Chiefs and the 49ers of San Francisco prepare for a rematch. It's just about 3.30 p.m. in New York. This is the Countdown to the Close. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Alex Steele. That's a pretty view, and I say that because, you know what, go do that. Because stocks are doing literally nothing. Volume is super light. Individual stocks moving quite a lot yep. because of earnings or something. But I just wonder, like, what are we waiting for now? And are we re reverting to an old playbook? We're waiting well, for we're data. Waiting for there Fed. was none today. We're right. waiting for Fed speak, but we basically know what the message is going to be. So we're waiting for earnings, which, you know, the big earnings have already come and gone. So we'll Except see. For retail next week, I think. Would retail, we'll yeah. Something about the economy. And the consumer, which mm -hmm. is of huge, huge importance to everyone, right? Well, speaking of the consumer and the economy, um, a lot of spending is going to happen this weekend. Are you doing anything this weekend? No, but I know the right answer is I should be watching the Super Bowl on Sunday. Yeah, five days okay. to go before the Super Bowl in Las Vegas, where the Kansas City Chiefs kick off against the San Francisco 49ers. So I'm thrilled to welcome Mark Donovan, the longtime president of the Chiefs. He is responsible for all of the Chiefs' non-football operations. Mark, so good to see you. 
Thank you. It's great to be with you guys. So your team is playing the Super Bowl for the fourth time in five years. Just making it to the big game once is a huge, huge deal. It's incredibly difficult. So congratulations, first of all. And I'm curious, does this make the Chiefs a dynasty team? Uh, we're not going to use the D word just yet. We're going to focus on doing what we've done all season long and leaving each other and getting through Sunday with another victory and hopefully another Super Bowl championship. Now, for those who are not making it to Vegas, the Super Bowl is the ultimate appointment viewing TV experience. For five months of the year, we know NFL games top the ratings. Um, Alex, your daughter is a huge Taylor Swift huge. fan. Has she been watching NFL games? No, but she might on Sunday. There you go. So everyone is watching football, including young girls, teenage girls. Mark, is there still an untapped demographic in the U.S. that the NFL has yet to reach or win over? Absolutely. I think there's an untapped market in the U.S. I think there's an untapped market internationally. And I think, to Alex's point, um, you know, our demographic reach has continued to expand. So if you look at the traditional NFL fan, over the years, like any sport, it has aged. And the reality is with this product that we put out there, with the fact that the NFL games themselves have just generated this enormous rating surge that really separates it from just about any other content on television. And then go deeper into that, you see the demographic shifts. And um, our team, fortunately, is one of those teams that's been able to deliver really, really strong revenue, really, really strong ratings. Mm -hmm. And within those ratings, really expand the demographic of our fan base. And of course, Taylor Swift responsible for part of that because she's dating the tight end Travis Kelsey. According to one estimate, she has increase the value of your franchise by more than $330 million. Wow. Does that sound right to you? Well, she's been a positive impact on the entire league and obviously a huge impact on the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, I would say this, that she's had a huge impact. Um, I'll go back to that demographic point, mm -hmm. that she's had a huge impact in expanding our demographics. So to Alex's point earlier, you know, her daughter is now a fan of the NFL and probably a fan of the Chiefs because she's a fan of Taylor Swift. That We've seen that internationally. And the timing of this for us has been really, really positive. If you look at what our ratings have done over the years pre-Taylor, we've been on a really, really good run. And winning Super Bowls and having success is a big driver of that. If they're expansion internationally and the games in, in Germany, that's expanded that further. Yeah. Then you add the fact that Taylor and Travis are a couple right now and her international fan base, all of a sudden we're playing in Germany. All those things yeah. match up and really help us grow pretty quickly. I think there's betting on whether or not Taylor Swift can get from Japan to the Super Bowl. Like I think that you can now bet on that. Um, Mark, to that point, and forgive the question, it's really hard to know where to watch football in terms of streaming, what channel, and cable. For someone who doesn't follow on a regular basis, how do, how do I manage that? How do you manage that? Yeah, so it's, it's been a really um, important point for our league as a general point. And, you know, when you look at the NFL versus other sports leagues, the commissioner made a comment yesterday during his press conference um, that, you know, we're one of the few teams, one of the few leagues that actually puts the majority of its content on over-the-air free television. Mm. Um, the world is changing and consumers are consuming content differently. You know, I used the example of Germany a few minutes ago. You know, our game in Germany was the highest rated game in the history of international broadcasts. You know, a few weeks later we're in the playoffs and our playoff game in the wild card round against the Dolphins was streamed on Peacock. Right. While there are critics of that, the reality is that 23 million viewers tuned in to Peacock. It was the highest streamed game and highest streamed event in the history of streaming. So the consumers are everywhere and the consumers are going to find us in general. The reality is back to that demographic point that the streaming audience of that game against the Dolphins in the playoff round actually was one of the younger audience in the history of playoff games. So it, it actually reduced the average age by about 10 years. Right. So that's a really powerful point when you look at how our product is being consumed. You talked about the Chiefs growing its brand overseas in places like Germany. How would you characterize uh, marketing the team to a Kansas City specific market, which obviously you dominate, versus um, an international market or even the national market here in the U.S.? Yeah, it's an amazing opportunity for us right now. And I'll go back to that point about the timing and everything converging. You know, it started with our founder, Lamar Hunt, who really, really believed in the growth of this game worldwide. And he was thinking that in the 60s and the 70s. 
now we have the opportunity with the NFL to literally expand our broadcast rate, our, our reach internationally. I mentioned uh, that game in Germany. You know, that created an opportunity for us to just expand our fan base. We saw that in 15 and 14. We were in London to play a game in London, and we saw the same thing. Fans are coming worldwide to come to the Chiefs games, to experience the Chiefs product. And now all this is combining, right? You can mm-hmm. so things live in a place you've never seen before. Got it, got it. You mentioned um, Hunt, Mr. Hunt, the Chiefs owner right now is Clark Hunt, and he told Bloomberg News that he sees private equity investors as a potential source of capital uh, for franchises. From where you sit, that obviously hasn't happened yet, but from where you sit, what operational value and best practices would institutional investors like hedge funds bring to the league? Do you think it'd be good uh, for the league the way it has been for European football, or has it not been good for European football? I think you've seen it across all sports. Look at the NBA and the amount of institutional investors who are there. Um, I, you know, the NFL does a really, really good job of this. They're very methodical. We look at things and try to learn from others, and then we try to figure out what's best for us. Our model has worked very, very well over the years. We've formed a committee. Our chairman, Clark Hunt, is on that committee that is looking at this right now and trying to figure out, does this make sense for us as a league? What are the pros and what are the cons? We have a meeting coming up in March, um, and that committee is planning to present to the owners their findings. I expect that you're going to see this in the future, but we're going to take it like we take everything. We're going to be very methodical, Mm -hmm. and we're going to do the right thing for the National Football League. Mark, do you think that those kind of investments, if and when they come, will be passive, active? Does it matter? Has it paid off in Europe in the same way that you might expect? Yeah, it's hard to say right now until this committee comes back to us. I would say that when you look at all the models that are out there, you look at what has happened in the NBA, you look at what has happened internationally with Premier League, we'll, we'll take that as evidence. We'll take that as best practices. We'll learn from their successes and we'll learn from their mistakes. So I think it's a little premature to make a decision right now, mm-hmm. um, but we're going to take this finding from our committee and then we'll make decisions based on that. All right, Mark, we got to leave it there. But before we go, uh, are you willing to give us a prediction on the final score? Well, my hope is that uh, our team and our fans continue to believe in the things we've done all season long, um, trust each other and have some success on Sunday and hopefully bring another trophy home to Kansas City. And maybe then you can say the word, the D word, the dynasty word. (laughs) (laughs) We'll have a discussion after that. Okay. He's not going to jinx it. He's not going to jinx it. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations and good luck to you. Mark Donovan is the president of the Kansas City Chiefs. So what are you doing Sunday? Uh, uh, I'm actually going to get on a plane later on, but beforehand I'm going to watch the game. I'm, watch the game. Okay. Yes, I'm bound through marriage to root for the 49ers. Got it. But yeah. if that didn't happen, I'd maybe root- things would be different. Yeah, I mean, I root for whoever's more entertaining at the moment. Okay, fair enough. Apparently, we'll both be watching. And I guess you're going to have to watch too because of Taylor Swift. I, right? I mean, I'm guessing, and also apparently we're going to talk about this now Monday at work. So yes. I think I should probably be read in on it, and that would be an easy way of doing it. So it's yeah, four okay, hours we'll watch on your it. Sunday. There right. you go. Pretty much. All right, coming up, uh, we're going to pivot here because in the tech sector, the layoffs keep coming, and this time it's at DocuSign. The shares are sliding after the software company announced it's cutting staff by six percent and restructuring. This is the close. now for stock of the hour and we're taking a look at DocuSign the electronic signature tech company you got shares down by over two percent however if you look at that chart just for this year it is ugly they announced a restructuring plan that includes laying off about six percent of its workforce uh, disappointing investors they were hoping for a takeover plan that didn't work anyway Abigail Doolittle is joining us with some of the details Abigail and if you were to take that chart back Alex it would be down 80 percent from the peak back in 2021 or the pandemic peak essentially so they've been in a world of hurts so and they, of course, were one of the pandemic darlings, ton of uh, business and revenue, and then competition came in and not so much. So this uh, d- decline today on the workforce reduction, it's interesting because some stocks on these reduction plans, they actually soar. Yesterday we had S.A. Lauder soaring, Snap did not, SockGen did not. So today we have this one down as well on this. And I think it has more to do with the fact that some people are taking this as an admission, this cutting of the workforce restructuring as an admission that a possible sta- sale has stalled, um, th- that that's the bigger idea here 
here that people had been hoping for that sale to maybe Bain Capital, Hellman and Friedman. Apparently, they weren't really able to figure out a price. And then last week, there was an interesting article on the Bloomberg about um, some of the big banks, J.P. Morgan and Bank of America, potentially being willing to finance one of those deals, which is kind of new. But this is just like one of those trends for 2024. I mean, I think there's already 16,000 jo- 16, tech jobs laid off last year, uh, last month, excuse me. And then, of course, we had Spotify in December. So, you know, on and on and on. Uh, they're saying it's AI, but I've started to wonder, is it like a sign of something a little bit more insidious in a yeah, way? Or, or you have to wonder too, Scar, like, is it actually just that or is it just right-sizing the pandemic, right? So you're just sort of erasing the last four years or is mm-hmm. there like a real big downturn. Remember Lee Drogan from Estimize? Yeah. So he covers Bitcoin now, but he used to come around and talk about earnings all the time. And I remember him saying, when DocuSign goes down, the pandemic is over. Like that was his like number one indicator stock. I love that. I mean, it's it's just a way to gauge where we are in the cycle. I feel like people still use DocuSign, but it's just not going to get the growth that it did during the pandemic. So it's just plateaued and that's it. It's a business, but it's not going to grow. There's competition, right? It doesn't have a competition from Adobe, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, And also how they make money off of it. and all that at the same time. So I think, it, but, it is, but again, is it just normalizing or is it showing something very different? Or is it a good idea and maybe it needs to be acquired by someone else as part of a bigger package? Yeah, that might be the idea. Yeah. Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much for our stock of the hour. What do we have coming you up? You can do it. You can do it. Should I do this? Hey, you were just tagged. You should tease. It's all, all right. good. Well, let's talk about the earnings <laughs> that are coming on deck. Uh, we've got Ford. We've got Chipotle. We've got Snap. We've got one that you're looking forward to. Yeah, VF Corp. Yeah, VF Corp. I love, I love me VF Corp. What, what, what brands do they have again? Vans, Timberland. You said North Face, right? North Face, yeah. So mothers of teenage boys uh, frequent their lives. So basically just, just Scarlet, pretty much. <laughs> we're going to break down what else investors should watch uh, with Christina Hooper of Invesco. Coming up next, this is the close on Bloomberg. I got to say, though, equity markets doing a whole lot of nothing. You got the S&P pretty much flat on the day and volume very, very light despite a nice flow of earnings. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Scarlett Fu, and you are? I'm Alex Steele. And uh, it's 2015 and all over again. It is. It's the same thing. Um, okay, so what I'm watching here as we go into the close, S&P doing nothing. But underneath, some interesting stuff. The Chinese Dragon Index that tracks a lot uh, of Chinese equities then here in the U.S. is actually up because Bloomberg reported that regulators could actually update leadership on what's going on with the market and conditions. And, mm. you know, that could be some sp- uh, spillover, filter through into the equity market. And just important as we set up for the open of that session and the close of this. The other thing that I love to watch here is the New York Community Bank Corp. Will you look at that? Down 22 percent yet again. Double digits, fourth time in five days. Lowest since 1997. There may not be huge bank stress, as, uh, as uh, Secretary Treasury Janet Yellen said, but there is stress. Oh, there is stress particular on that, banks. Yeah, on that name and on regional banks in general and just questions about their exposure to mm-hmm. commercial real estate, right? And Spirit Aerosystems, a bit of a rebound here, up 4.4%. Yep, but they didn't issue guidance, of course, because of the Boeing issue. So there's that. All right. There's also a lot of Fed speak out today, which accounts for the recovery in treasuries, with, of course, investors listening closely for any clues on the rate outlook. It would be a mistake to move rates down too soon or too quickly without sufficient evidence that inflation was on a sustainable and timely path back to 2%. If the economy evolves as I, as I expect, I think, it will, I think we will gain that confidence later this year, and then we can be, begin moving rates down. The last three to six months has been surprisingly good news. Uh, again, I don't want to say we're done yet. I don't want to say we're necessarily going to just glide past all the way to 2%, but fingers crossed, uh, the data is looking uh, positive. All right, joining us now is Christina Hooper, Chief Global Market Strategist over at Invesco. Christina, there's been a lot of volatility in the bond market uh, the last couple of days, what with the data, and then of course with FedSpeak and with with, uh, Chair Jay Powell said about March being pretty much off the table. Um, that instability, that volatility, has it ended for now or is it going to continue to churn and continue to you know, throw equities into this world of uncertainty? I think it's absolutely going to continue because that uncertainty will persist. Um, The reality is the Fed wants to tamp down financial conditions. They don't want to see them ease. So they have a very vested interest in sending that message that they are not going to cut in March and that they could hold for longer. Whether or not they actually do that is another thing, but I think they're going to... 
certainly inject a lot of uncertainty into markets in coming days and weeks. So a lot of the data we see is like, oh, well, yeah, just push out the cuts. Like, this is not an economy that needs it. But then we get the data from the Federal Reserve of New York today talking about household uh, debt and balance sheets and sort of how much debt is being loaded on. Do we need the cuts? Do we not need the cuts? We absolutely need the cuts, although I don't think there's a big difference between March 20th and May 1st. I think it's okay. the level of cuts we get this year. I think we need between 100 and 150 basis points. I think we're going to get that, um, but I, I know that that is certainly not the narrative that the Fed is going to be pushing right now. So Alex brought up New York Community Bank and how it's tumbling yet again down 22 percent. Um, it's had a little bit of a relief rally just on a Friday in that it stopped falling for the first time in, in four days. Nevertheless, the pressure continues on these smaller lenders. The big question is, is this the start of a new round of turmoil for the regional lenders? Your take is not necessarily. No, I think that's very unlikely. Um, certainly, as we saw last spring, last March and April, um, there were a few names that had some specific factors that they all shared that created that weakness. And similarly, we're seeing that now. Now, it is casting a pall over regional banks in general, but if we were actually to dive down, there are only a few that have really those, those same vulnerabilities. So I do not think this is contagion at all. This is very much contained. It's still like $4 stock. That's got to hurt. Um, so why do we need seven cuts, six cuts this year, as you're looking at? Because it makes sense given the level of disinflation. I go back to something Chris Waller said. So is that normalization said. or is that like, oh my God, it is, the growth is going to fall out of bed? It is normalization. It has nothing to do with growth. Although I do think we have to worry about the lagged effects of such aggressive tightening. But this is simply about policy, that when you get significant progress on disinflation and you admit that rates are in very restrictive territory, you need to start cutting. So it's very much what um, we heard from Chris Waller back at the end of November. And it's actually what we heard from Jay Powell at the FOMC press conference last week. Now, he's certainly also talking tough and trying to sound hawkish. But at the end of the day, I do believe that's going to be the Fed's policy. Let's talk about overseas markets. Uh, Alex brought up the Chinese index that is rising today on hopes that we'll get something concrete out of uh, Chinese authorities. That's been the theme for the last couple of months, waiting to see if policymakers come up with something that appeases investors. And it, so far, it hasn't happened. Why the faith that something has got to come now? Well, first of all, I think that investors are overlooking some of what they've already heard from Chinese policymakers. They have made some strides. There has been some policy. Um, but you, know, you can often see, with whether it's a sector, whether it's a stock, or whether it's a region, you can get oversold conditions. You can get um, pessimism that really isn't grounded in reality. And I think that's what we're seeing today is an over pessimism that doesn't reflect the opportunities for Chinese equities. And so a lot has been overlooked. Um, but certainly, if we get more in the way of policy stimulus, I think that could be a very, very powerful catalyst, especially given valuations are so attractive. You have to wonder, Scarlett, though, will we get the same boost that we did last year at this time? Because we were kind of burned, right? Like if you invested in luxury and rode that boom a little bit because you were going to get the, you know, consumer policy and we didn't get that. And then yeah. now those retailers have fallen out of bed. Like, will you get the interest at the same time? Uh, that's a really, really good point. Um, we were talking earlier about how earnings are going to come out after the close. And we've kind of hit a slower period of corporate earnings. But the retailers will start to come out. What will you be watching for? You're someone who's looking for six to seven rate cuts this year. What are you going to be watching for from the retailers as they give an outlook? Well, it's all about their confidence in the consumer, um, how much they think the consumer is overextended. Although the reality is within retail, there are some very different business models. Some will work, some brands will work, some won't. So it's <clears throat> certainly help, helpful to get some kind of outlook on the consumer. But at the end of the day, it's going to be very company specific as it always is. Christina, really appreciate your joining us as always. Christina Hooper is Chief Global Market Strategist over at Invesco. Alex, no data to speak of, but you know, I still go back to that jobs report on Friday that was unusually strong, kind of knocked everyone's expectations off the, the the charts, the, the whatever, charts. the roof. Um, yeah, but talking about that Fed Reserve, uh, New York Bank, talking about consumers, here's some stuff for you. Consumers aged 30 to 39 are struggling with delinquencies mm. on their credit card debt. And credit card balances have increased in the fourth quarter to $1.13 uh, trillion. Just a point, I mean, it's not going to be across the board, but that's going to be bifurcated in some way, right? And if you have 30 to 39-year-olds with less purchasing power, like, 
what kind of retailer does that support? What kind of growth and consumption does that support? I know. So it's kind of a disservice to talk about the consumer at large because you really have to designate what kind of consumer. Higher income consumer, lower income consumer. Exactly. They face very different fates. Yeah. All right. We are moving closer to the closing bell. We've got full market coverage right here on Bloomberg as we take you to the bell and beyond and rejoin our radio colleagues. This is The Close. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. We are about two minutes away from the end of this trading day. I'm Scarlett Fu here with Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell here to help us take you beyond the bell with a global simulcast. Carol Masser and Tim Stenovic bring together all of our different platforms, Bloomberg Television, Bloomberg Radio, uh, YouTube audiences who are streaming to uh, parse through the most exciting moments. But I have to say, Carol, there's what? not a lot of exciting moments in the trade today in equities. It's like, what's going on? Like, it feels like a meh market, if you will. But after the last couple of days, and as we have been kind of obsessed with parsing over Jay Powell after the Fed meeting and then after 60 minutes, um, I do feel like there's some calm. Having said that, we do have some earnings. We've seen some big movers today. I'm thinking about Ford reporting after the close. And it's up four percent in today's session so you do have some names that are outperforming the kind of malaise you're seeing or melanin okay in the market. what do you guys want <laughs> from this market like we're addicted to drama okay <laughs> alex yeah. we're up 2.2 percent just this month on the s p 500 the nasdaq composite up almost three percent just this month not every day can have wild swings of one and one and a half percent. Are you mansplaining the market? No. To us? I'm, oh. Okay, I guess it's fair wow, to say that hurts. because that hurts, man. Uh, you know I'm the only guy here. Yeah, he's got nothing. He had nowhere help, to go from help, there. Help Romaine. But, help Alex. But go to ahead. that point, um, the S and P is trading 11 percent above its 200-day moving average. So the idea that we can get stretched. Maybe we take a pause and a break. Positioning is still very much one way. Citigroup saying that U.S. tech stocks is now so bullish that anything could trigger a sell-off. So maybe we're just in, in you know, we're just waiting. We're just Thanks waiting for backing for me up, Alex. I appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> anything we can do to help, right? Um, okay, there you have the closing bells. We're about to close out a day in which uh, actually indexes <laughs> did have a little bit of a rally heading into the close. Last 20 minutes is pretty much a straight line higher, but volume is still very, very light at this point. The S&P 500 closing up with a quarter of 1%, 49.54, just below that 5,000 level. Dow Industrials gaining a third of 1%. The Nasdaq, little change on the day. Let's round it up to one-tenth of 1%. And the Russell 2000 gaining nine-tenths of 1%, the outperformer of the yeah. bunch. Yeah, and a little bit of buying right here in the close. Having said that, um, uh, you're looking at what most of the names in the S&P 500 higher today. 351 to the upside, guys, 150 to the downside, and Scarlet to unchanged. All right, let's look at the sectors. Our IMAP, which uh, really showcases the different sectors in the S&P 500. There's not a lot of red. The red really is in tech, which is down half of 1%, and communication services losing two-tenths of 1%. That's why it's so sizable on that chart. But overall, in terms of gainers, materials, gaining 1.7%, REITs uh, up 1.5%, and healthcare also gaining at least 1%. All right, guys, let's get to some of the individual gainers, if I may. GE Healthcare, go figure. It is top in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100. Biggest intraday gain in more than a year. Uh, of course, the you know former member included in General Electric, it was spun off, as we all know. It's now a medical technology company exclusively. Earnings and sales for the fourth quarter beat estimates, and that Scarlet with City calling it better than expected. This name up almost 12% here. All right, let me just jump in really quickly mm -hmm. because MicroStrategy has reported results and the fourth quarter revenue misses analyst estimates uh, down 6% to 124 million. Uh, analysts were expecting 133 million. This is a company that really is just a way to play Bitcoin uh, given its strategy now. Uh, Michael Saylor has basically decided to bet the enterprise software maker's future entirely on Bitcoin. So the stock off by 2.6% as again, mm. the fourth quarter revenue misses the average analyst estimate. Okay, so some other highlights from uh, the report. The company now holds 190,000 Bitcoin. Uh, they acquired 31,755 Bitcoin since the end of Q3. They paid $1.25 billion for that, or $39,411 per Bitcoin. 190,000 Bitcoin at a total cost of $5.93 billion. So uh, that average price uh, of 31224 per Bitcoin. That's as of February uh, 5th, 2024. Talking about the important stuff here, Scarlett. Yeah, let's go to important stuff too. Uh, let's go to Gilead and Amgen. So uh, Gilead just coming out right now, uh, you have revenue for the fourth quarter coming like bang in line with estimates. They're forecast for this year. Uh, also, 
maybe a little bit light on the low end, but high on the high end, so 27.5 billion. Um, if you take a look for uh, some of their most important drugs, uh, Trodelvi, uh, we're waiting to see what's going to happen there because that failed to keep patients alive longer in the lung cancer trial. Uh, but overall, it does see earnings for this year and revenue this year. It appears in the high end to be a little bit better uh, than estimated, guys. All right, so let's get to Amgen. Also reporting, as you mentioned, um, Alex, Amgen, let's go to the outlook. Sees 2024 revenue, folks, of $32.4 billion to $33.8 billion. The estimate out there is $32.51 billion. So it does sound like it's uh, kind of moving up the higher end, if you will, or the upper end. And uh, fourth quarter revenue, going back to the fourth quarter, $8.2 billion, that's a beat. $8.12 billion was the estimate among uh, analysts out there on the street. Fourth quarter adjusted EPS, $4.71 a share. That's $0.11 cents better than what the street was expecting. And uh, also looking at fourth quarter adjusted operating income, a $3.66 billion. And bang, that was in line with what the street was expecting. And the important thing to remember with Amgen is that it is now a player or mm -hmm. wants to be a player in the uh, obesity drug market, right, because of its purchase of horizon. Horizon Therapeutics mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, over the past year in October, it closed in October, $27.8 billion uh, purchase. And as a result, Amgen is looking for uh, revenue to jump as much as 20% this year, thanks to the it's seemingly bottomless demand for these uh, treatments. Uh, just going through the press release, looking for some color. Amgen shares up by uh, just about half a percentage point right now. Uh, the company CEO is saying that 2023 was another year of performance and progress for our company. Our marketed products are reaching many more patients around the world, and we anticipate more than a dozen significant pipeline milestones in 2024, Alex. Yep, and we're still waiting uh, for other earnings as well. VF Corp, so good look on the retailers. We're going to be getting that. We're also waiting uh, for Ford, uh, so looking out there as well. And just to reiterate, uh, when it comes to Gilead, um, let me go back to here. Uh, uh, they're looking at about their 2024 uh, earnings as well as revenue and sales could have bumped up on the higher end versus estimates. So very similar to what Carol was talking about when it comes to Amgen. Yeah, I'm looking at Amgen, right, which is up already about 10% this year. And as you guys said, you know, we're not seeing a ton of movement in the after hours, just going back to it. Now it's just down, Scarlett, about half a percent here. Yeah, I'm looking ahead to Ford. I'm really Me excited too. to see what the company says yes. with regards to uh, EVs because we know that um the big legacy car makers, GM, Ford, they've really had to scale back a lot of their ambitions as Tesla and uh, the other EV makers continue to cut costs. And look, the numbers just cross. Yeah, it's like we that. wished it to happen. Nice All right, job. let's uh, talk about Ford here. Fourth quarter, uh, where should we start? Fourth uh, go to the Outlook, maybe? Yeah, let's go to 2024. Um, yeah. Ford Model E EBIT loss. Okay, that's the electric vehicle. Five billion to five and a half billion dollars. Mm. Uh, 2024 adjusted EBIT wow. of 10 billion to what? 12 billion. Analysts were looking for nine and a quarter Reagan. billion. Yeah, I'm looking at the. Uh, it's a, a slew of numbers here. Adjusted EPS coming in above estimates too. 29 cents versus estimates of 13 cents. Uh, shares were higher by uh, about four percent today in the after hours. Uh, uh, shares higher now uh, by 2.6 percent. I'm going to say this outlook is really important. Sees 2024. For adjusted EBIT of 10 to 12 billion, the estimate was 9.24. Remember, General Motors came out and they kind of set it up. They put out an adjusted EBIT of for 2024 of about 12 to 14 billion, and that beat that estimate that was on the street of about 10.96. So, in other words, they set the bar high, saying, "Yep, we're having troubles with EV. We understand there's been kind of a readjustment, but look at what we are doing in terms of the overall outlook as we kind of shift yeah. our product mix and basically our." Ed Ludlow, we talked to, said, let's see if we get four to give an outlook uh, similar to what we got from GM that is upbeat. And that's essentially what we got. And you've got <laughs> Ford up about 6.2% here in the aftermarket. And if you don't like those numbers, then they'll be like, look at this shiny thing over here. And that's a <laughs> first quarter supplemental yep. dividend <laughs> of 18 cents a share. So you may not like where we are in the mix. You may not like where we are in terms of reallocating money and workers. And we don't may not like our margins when it comes to our EVs, but we have this nice little supplementary uh, dividend of 18 cents a share. Yeah, it buys us some time as we try to reconfigure everything. Meta did it. I mean, Meta's numbers were blowout, obviously, but overall there's a big transition taking place at the company, and that dividend widens the shareholder base, certainly. I mean, Ford doesn't have that issue because, of course, its shareholder base is there, um, and a supplemental dividend, does that mean it's a one-time thing and it's, it's not going to like build a, off like of that? Extra juicing? 
Yeah. I'm interested like to it. hear how Ford positions itself right now, given that it's made this pivot away from electric vehicles or uh, de-emphasizing electric vehicles. De-emphasizing, given, yeah. De-emphasizing, given the struggle that it's had in recent months when it comes to the Mach-E and the, um, the F-150 Lightning. Here's what Jim Farley, the CEO, said in the press release. He said, mm-hmm. he, he's, he's talking about consumer choice. He said, we're the only company that gives customers such a wide range of choices, gas, hybrid, and EVs made possible by our Ford Plus plan and the talented team that's carrying it out. Ford is creating a product software and services powerhouse with huge potential for this year and the long haul. Yeah, also in the press, le- press release, we're say- they've got a quote, EVs are here to stay, customer adoption is growing and their long-term upside is central to Ford. Um, so this is also coming from the C-suite in Ford. So anyway, this stock definitely off and running with that outlook. So uh, you're looking at what, Ford up about 8.2% uh, here in the Thank afternoon. Thank you, shiny bright thing of supplemental <laughs> yeah. dividend. Thank you, supplementary dividend. But also guys, they gave an outlook that despite all the nervousness and concerns, they're like, we got some good numbers, better than what the street was expecting. They, did, they definitely managed expectations well. All right. <laughs> Is that a little skepticism? All right, guys, that's a wrap. Our cross-platform coverage on radio, TV, YouTube, and Bloomberg Originals. We call it Beyond the Bell. We'll see you again, same time, same place, tomorrow. All right, coming up on The Close here on Bloomberg Television, we've got more earnings analysis coming up. We're going to start with Ford. Don't go anywhere. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu, and joining me now is Shanali Bassa. Great to see you. Great to see you. Busy earnings day. Busy earnings day. Let's just talk about the numbers that crossed uh, in the last few minutes. We're going to start with Ford. The shares are rallying right now in the after hours trade after Ford said it will pay a first quarter supplemental dividend of 18 cents a share. As for the numbers themselves, fourth quarter numbers beat analyst estimates. 29 cents was the adjusted EPS. Analysts were looking for 13 cents. The outlook is also higher than anticipated uh, insofar as as it sees just a bit of 10 to 12 billion dollars analysts were looking for just under nine and a quarter billion but again uh, Ford had given a, some lowered guidance back in November and the stock had tumbled on that so it had managed expectations let's bring in Ed Ludlow who is the co-host of Bloomberg technology and has also been going through the numbers Ed, what pops out to you yeah, I think you guys are right that the outlook for, for EBIT of 10 to $12 billion, even at the low end of that range, it's above what the street expected. And it was exactly what the street cheered when General Motors gave that outlook last year. When you read the earnings release, they're, they're just reiterating the same story that there is a slowdown in growth of EV sales and they have already acted on that. Something that you haven't let covered, I, I see lower down the release from COO Gal Hotra is they've been able to identify $2 billion of cost savings relating to materials, freight, and manufacturing. And that's interesting in the context of Ford's global footprint um, because you guys nailed the story. They are cutting back on the output of EV supply because the demand's not there, but they're also having success with their legacy business. And if you look, for example, on the narrative of their profitability outside of North America, Mm -hmm. they're getting traction with that range of pickup in Europe, and they have a lower capital base in China that's working out for them. So it's good stuff. So if you had to kind of drill down on what investors are more excited about, you see about 7% of a rise after market in Ford stock right now. Is it more excitement around this cut of $2 billion in additional cost reductions, or is it this supplemental dividend? Are investors just excited to get some money back? It's probably both. It shows good cost discipline in a tough environment. I would also look at the CapEx forecast, which I think was slightly higher or above uh, what was estimated, and that gives a bit of confidence that 24 might be a bit better. They can be a bit more bullish and proactive. I'm just going to read this to you guys because I want to get this right. There is both a regular divvy and a supplemental divvy. Regular dividend of 15 cents, supplemental dividend of 18 cents per share, both payable March 1st to shareholders record on February 16th. But yeah, a nice little sweetener for, for investors, uh, old and new. Interesting that it would be a supplemental dividend. Right now, you can see the stock being cel- celebrating uh, the extra payout. But um, that supplemental dividend, I- I'm curious why they didn't go forward with something just a bigger increase overall. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the plan to continue to dial up output of the traditional combustion, internal combustion engine models? Because yeah. that's the moneymaker for Ford right now. 
Yeah, it, it's the money maker from Ford and it's where they took action. So not only did they say we're going to cut 50% of our planned output of the F-150 Lightning, for example, but we're going to take some of that workforce and put it to the assembly lines that are working on the likes of the Bronco, the likes of the Ford Ranger and the higher price point pickup and SUV. And um, what was interesting as well, you know, we, we really focused on the outlook, but at the quarter just gone, they had EBIT of $10.4 billion uh, for, to end the full year. That was at the higher end of their previously guided range, but it also takes into account the cost of the UAW contract, which Ford had said was $900 of additional cost per vehicle built, but it showed that they were able to manage uh, using the cash cow that is the legacy combustion engine business, the bottom line, and give us this positive outlook for this year. I also would say, if you have some time, read what they said about software and subscriptions in the release, because there's some pretty big numbers there. And it's a nascent business for them. Mm -hmm. But think about the parallel with Tesla and how much credence investors put onto software sales for Tesla going forward. Ed, thank you so much for your time. Now to bring you some breaking news as well, Snap results, Snap dropping pretty significantly after market, after revenue misses analyst estimates. We also have North American revenue, while it came in above estimates, Europe and the rest of the world fell short. Daily active users in North America fell short of estimates. We know that this is a company that is looking to cut costs as well. Shares extending their decline now more than 26% down after hours. In some of the commentary from the company as well, they are being impacted by the conflict in the Middle East. They say it was a headwind to year over year growth of approximately two percentage points in the fourth quarter, Scarlett. Yeah, that is an ugly uh, after hours print for Snap there. Uh, down 29% at the moment. Let's also bring you earnings out of Chipotle, the uh, the chain restaurant reporting comparable sales that beat analyst estimates, 8.4% increase in the fourth quarter. Analysts were looking for a 7.1% increase. EPS also tops the consensus, $10.36 for the period. Revenue, however, the top line, basically matching estimates, $2.5 billion, $2.49 billion was the expectation. Margins, however, uh, do exceed analyst estimates, 14.4% versus 13.8%. Let's stay on Chipotle here and bring in Michael Halen. He is Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Restaurant Analyst. Michael, what jumps out at you when you look at Chipotle? I, I'm curious about why the revenue, the top line matches, even as margins um, have beat the consensus. That's all cost cutting, isn't it? No, that could have just been uh, some of the timing of the new store openings in the quarter. They could have uh, opened in, in the in the latter half of, of the quarter. I would say it was a very strong print. Um, top line, they beat on the top line, they beat on the bottom line. Um, you know, they issued guidance that was uh, in line with, with consensus for 2024. So, you know, so far, there's, it's hard to find anything wrong with this print. If there's nothing wrong with this print, the question is what sustains the stock into the year? You see a stock that has been rising this year and had a very healthy boost the year prior. What's the story into 2024? It's going to be more of the same. I, I don't think there's any question um, that that uh, they can continue to grow the store base in, in, in that high single digit to almost 10 percent range. I, I'd say the two other main drivers are really traffic. Um, can they continue to grow traffic, which most of the restaurant uh, competitors haven't been doing for the last few years, uh, and they and can they continue to um, increase their restaurant and operating margins at the same time? Yeah, we know that consumers have been shifting to lower price items because we've seen prices for <clears throat> food and ingredients increase for all these different stores and restaurants. Um, what can we say about their promotional their promotions and what kind of offerings they can put out there to drive that traffic that will keep that growth uh, moving? Yeah, one of their strengths is that they don't really have to discount, right? There's, the demand is so strong that that's, that's not something they actively engage in. They typically bring customers into the fold more through their limited time offers. Um, you know, I, I'd say if I had a question, you know, going forward and, and in this call, it's going to be what they say about January, because January was a very difficult month uh, in the restaurant industry, just lapping very tough year over year comparisons mm -hmm. and uh, having much more, you know, much more tough winter weather to, to deal with. Um, so we're really interested in what they have to say about the first quarter same store sales guidance and how things went in January. Um, but that that would be, you know, the one minor concern. But in, in terms of things that they can control, 
uh, they're doing a phenomenal job. Well, speaking of uh, growth, it opened a record number of new restaurants. That was something highlighted high up in the statement here by CEO Brian Nickel. Do you think they can sustain this pace of growth? Uh, we don't see any reason. Why not? Um, you know, there's very strong demand for the brand. These new stores are generating very strong returns for the company. Um, so so we, we think there's still significant white space here in the United States. Uh, and, and, you know, as you saw on the release, they, they're, most of the stores that they're opening have Chipotle lanes, right? And so those stores tend to do even higher volume than some of the strip mall type locations. Um, so, yeah, in terms of, of U.S. growth, there's still some significant white space here. Chipotle lanes. I love that. All right. Michael Halen of Bloomberg Intelligence. Really appreciate your joining us again. Chipotle uh, knocking it out of the park when it comes to fourth quarter as uh, it raised prices, many prices in October for the first time in more than a year. Bloomberg will actually be speaking with Brian Nickel, the CEO of Chipotle, tomorrow at 2 p.m. New York time. You want to tune in to Bloomberg at that time. Still to come, we have more on Ford, whose shares are rallying right now after the automaker's adjusted forecast, EBIT forecast, beat analyst estimates, and it announced a supplemental first quarter dividend. David Trainer of New Constructs will be joining us with his take on Ford. This is The Close on Bloomberg. This is the close on Bloomberg. The big mover in after hours trading, trading that's gaining right now is shares of Ford up more than 6% after the automaker reported profit that topped analyst estimates for the fourth quarter. It curbed its EV outlook, but it did boost production of models fueled by gas, those traditional legacy vehicles. And on top of that, it uh, announced a supplemental dividend for the first quarter. Let's now bring in David Trainer. He is CEO of New Constructs, who currently has a buy rating on Ford. Um, Ford is one of your favorite favorite stocks, uh, David, and it's been that way for a long time. And one of the reasons is because it's not just a pure play EV. We know that it's losing money for uh, on the EV business, but that's OK because it's got a really strong legacy business. That's right. I, I think that the market is starting to wake up to this idea that being a diversified auto manufacturer is better than being a pure play EV maker uh, or a pure play in, internal combustible engine car maker. So the diversified uh, platform for Ford and GM, for that matter, is increasingly a competitive advantage, especially as we see the EV market softening. How do you think about the dynamic of investors looking for exposure to EV? You think about what's happening today. This will bring Ford into positive territory for the year. Tesla down significantly this year. Are investors just going to move back into pure play auto? I, you know, I don't think so. I, I think they want to be in diversified auto. Uh, I think Ford and other legacy automakers have proven they can they can produce super high quality electric vehicles. Uh, there's not really that much of a reason to pay the premium for Tesla unless you're just a huge Tesla fan. And <laughs> having the cash cow um, legacy business is, is just a, it's a big advantage. Uh, and it's you know there's a lot of experience there in large scale manufacturing that. You know, some of these EV pure plays have really yet to achieve and are still tr struggling to achieve. Uh, you know, we really don't really have a, a sort of a low cost, low market car from from Tesla. Uh, lots of promises on all kinds of things that uh, keep not coming true. Uh, meanwhile, Ford, GM, they just keep plugging away, taking market share and making a lot of money. What's there to like about today? You know, you look at some of the numbers, the supplemental dividend, you look at their cost cutting plan, billions of dollars on the line here on the chopping block. What as an investor are you looking for most in their numbers? What's not to like? I mean, you, you see a management team that has shown that they care about being good stewards of shareholder capital. Period. That's a rare thing these days. That's part of the reason why we've liked Forge for so long. There are very few executive teams out there that care about being good stewards of shareholder capital. Plenty of executives out there that are good about taking care of their own capital mm. and making sure they have outrageous pay packages. Uh, and, and those are conflicting interests with shareholders. They can work for some of the time because pumping the stock can make every, everybody money. But often if that comes at the underlying expense of an, a good fundamental business model, you're in trouble. And that's what Forbes is about. They're not about a bunch of flamboyant, bombastic statements. They're about executing 
generating cash flow and delivering real shareholder value over the long term. Speaking of shareholder value, I'm looking at a dividend yield of 4.97% and this announcement today that it will pay a first quarter supplemental dividend of 18 cents a share. Why supplemental, David? What is Ford holding on to? Why not increase it to a permanent uh, higher dividend? Why is Ford choosing to you know, hold something back and, and make sure it still has some flexibility? We're in a dynamic world. I mean, look, they, they've spent a lot of CapEx on building a new platform for electric vehicles, they may need some dry powder to, to lean more into that. I think it makes sense to cut back on it because they were sort of forced into it like with almost this, you know, it's ESG greenwashing, forced into maybe making more EVs than they needed to to show investors they could do it. Now they got to cut back. Who knows? Maybe the market shifts again. If I were that management team, I'd like to keep some dry powder around to make sure we can react and, and stay competitive in the way they always have been. Mm -hmm. And so, Giving all that capital or promising it all away maybe isn't a good idea. You can always give it to people again later if there's excess. But in the meantime, keep it around to make sure you stay as competitive as you need to stay. All right. Well said. David Trainer. really appreciate your joining us and giving us your instant analysis. You. David is CEO of New Constructs. Uh, lots of breaking news, this time not on earnings necessarily. Fox, ESPN and Warner Brothers are joining forces for a sports streaming site. Uh, once again, Fox, ESPN and Warner Brothers Discovery creating a joint streaming platform to share sports assets. Uh, and this comes, of course, as those sports rights, live sports rights continues to skyrocket higher. The understanding is it'll be on ESPN Plus, Hulu, Max subscribers will get access to co uh, college sports, regular way sports. Lots to look forward to for sports watchers. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Let's get back to a developing story with a big sports event coming up uh, this weekend. You have some big headlines on sports streaming because ESPN, Fox and Warner Brothers Discovery, they're joining forces to launch a sports focused streaming service that will feature major college and professional games. This will be uh, one third owned by each company. There's no details yet on pricing or name. Let's now bring in Chris Palmieri joining us from Los Angeles. Chris, is this something else that consumers will need to pay for? Yes. <laughs> but the companies are targeting uh, the non-cable subscribers because everything in this package is going to be sports that are available already if you pay for cable on ESPN or Fox or the Turner channels from Warner Brothers. So the idea is really at the, you know, aimed at the sports cord cutters, people who don't want all the other stuff they get for a cable package and are willing to pay for, for all of those mm -hmm. sports. Chris. This is the premier sports content, though. Yeah, it's amazing. You have Fox, ESPN, Warner Brothers. That means ESPN Plus, Hulu, and Mac subscribers will get access to this, whatever they're going to pay for it. We consider these rivals. How weird is it for them all to be getting together on a venture like this? It's very strange. I mean, if you think about Hulu in the early days, it was, was kind of an experimental thing from a lot of the big broadcasters, and it ultimately unwound, and, and Disney owns all of it. Uh, this is certainly an unusual situation. They haven't decided who's going to manage it yet, but you can imagine there'll be fights over control and payments and strategy and things like that. So it's, it's, this is a very unique situation. You know, one thing that's missing, or two things that are missing, are um, NBC and CBS. The Super Bowl is going to be broadcast on CBS. They're nowhere in this partnership. That's also kind of weird because you're not actually solving any problems. You're just, it's still fragmented, isn't it? Right, you know, so you're still going to need uh, those two other subscriptions if you want to get the complete, you know, major broadcast package. And, of course, Apple and, and Amazon are also right. getting major sports rights. So this doesn't solve everything, but it's sort of a step in the direction of the people who don't want to pay for cable but really want all those sort of, you know, premier shows, you know, Fox, uh, you know, Afternoon, Monday Night Football, all of that, you know, the college tournaments, right. uh, March Madness and that. The best quote I've heard about uh, media is the history of media is bundling and unbundling. So this is just bundling once again, Shanali. They're all friends until there's not. And we right. should remember that all of these titans of this industry are facing strategic questions of their own. Chris, what does this mean for Warner Brothers Discovery and ESPN Disney in particular? Uh, well, you know, this raises questions now and Disney reports tomorrow, uh, you know, what that whole strategy of taking ESPN direct, there was... You know, they've always had ESPN Plus, which has some of the lesser sports, but uh, Bob Iger, the CEO, has talked about a direct version that may no longer be needed if, if this package exists. 
for Warner Brothers, you know, they're you know, looking for different ways to monetize the content that they've got. So this is another avenue for that. Same with Fox, which doesn't really have a streaming service. And so, you know, this is their way to, to capture uh, that new subscriber. But again, this is not great news for the cable bundle, you know, the traditional cable guys, Comcast, Charter, and all those folks. Uh, there's less reason now to subscribe to those if you can get the sports live yeah. direct from this. And to Scarlett's point, perhaps more expensive for the cord cutter themselves. Thank you, Bloomberg's Chris Palmieri on Breaking News. We're going to turn now to politics because a federal appeals court has ruled that Donald Trump can be prosecuted for trying to overturn the 2020 U.S. election, rejecting his claim that a president is immune from criminal charges. And that's all as the former president is all but guaranteed a victory in the Nevada primary today, a very complicated primary, that is. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg Balance of Power host Kayleen Lines. Maybe we start with Trump's presence in the primary itself because of how complicated the primary is on top of this other layer of news woven in. Well, Shanali, just to underscore how complicated this is, Trump isn't actually even technically on the ballot in the primary. This is the first time that a primary is being held in the state of Nevada in over two decades because of a new law that dictates you have to have a primary if more than one candidate is in the running, which is why the Democrats are holding a primary today. And there is a Republican primary as well in which Nikki Haley is on the ballot. But Nikki Haley cannot actually get any delegates from that because of the decision of the Republican uh, Party in Nevada that says we're going ahead with a caucus and the caucus is where you get the delegates and the caucus is what Donald Trump uh, is in the running for. So presumptively, all of these delegates are going to go for him. That said, I would note that Nikki Haley, according to her campaign, really hasn't been putting much stock in Nevada. They haven't been devoting time and resources to that state. They're really focused on the South Carolina primary coming up on February 24th, as of course that is her home state, but she is still lagging far behind the former president by about 30 points in the most recent polling. Yeah, that's pretty incredible, given that it is her home state, that she was governor there. Mm -hmm. I want to turn to the headline that Shanali told us earlier, which is that a federal appeals court has ruled uh, Trump can be prosecuted for trying to overturn the 2020 election. Has he responded yet? And is his next move to basically appeal to the Supreme Court? He has until February 12th to do just that, to take this to the highest court in the land, Scarlett. So he has about six days to uh, make that decision. But his campaign in a statement reacting, uh, reacting to the ruling we got from the D.C. Circuit Court here said that he does indeed attend, intend to appeal. So it will be a question now as to how this moves forward. If the Supreme Court even decides they want to hear this or they will let the ruling today stand, in which the three ju uh, judges that were on this panel effectively said that the former president is not former President Trump. He is citizen Trump and that therefore he is not in entitled to the immunity from prosecution he had during the time in which he was president. They said that effectively that argument that the former president has been making would render the entire se separation of powers uh, unusable because it would put the executive, the, the president of the United States, out of the reach of the executive branch, the judicial branch, mm -hmm. and the legislative branch, that effectively it, it goes against the Constitution in that way. So it's going to be a question of timing moving forward. If the Supreme Court decides to hear this, how quickly, how quickly would they rule, knowing that this trial originally was supposed to start on March 4th? The judge in this case, Judge Ch uh, Tanya Chutkin, vacated that date last week as we awaited this immunity decision. And we're waiting to see if this could actually go to trial before the Republican convention in July, or more importantly, the election in November. And keep in mind as well, at the end of March, March 25th, Trump is still slated. It is still on the books right now for him to go to trial in the state of New York in the hush money payments uh, made to Stormy Daniels' case. A lot of moving parts there, Kelly. Um, I don't know how you keep it all in your head, but thank you for that roundup. Kelly Hines uh, of Bloomberg. And of course, you'll want to catch Kelly and Joe Matthew hosting Balance of Power at the top of the next hour. Let's stay on Washington here and discuss the risk of the U.S. elections for financial markets. Drew Pettit, director of U.S. equity strategy for Citi, joins, now, joins us now. Drew, how are you thinking about this federal appeal court ruling on Trump uh, able to be prosecuted for trying to overturn the 2020 election? We know that uh, the Trump campaign, the Trump response has been that they will appeal and presumably to the Supreme Court. But how does this um, play out in terms of how you're assessing the election impact on the markets? Look, first, I think the starting point for all of this when it comes to U.S. politics and markets is expect the unexpected. And admittedly, we can't just look to history as a guide for a lot of these events that are unfolding. So how we're thinking about markets, in admittedly, this is really, really early. We're starting to focus on Trump versus Biden. Look, a lot of the early polling and, and markets and so on have 
you know, we have the rematch coming up. So right now we're trying to think about those two against each other. I understand the news is evolving. Things can change. But right now it's Trump versus Biden in our assessment of potential political risks this year. OK, got it. Um, you mentioned that it's still really early and people say this all the time as well, that it's not going to be an issue until at the earliest, the second half of 2024. Nevertheless, I'm curious as to hear um, as to what your clients are asking you when it comes to the election. Is this something that they bring up with you at all? Oh, a ton, a ton. It's all sorts of clients, fast money, long only, all sorts right now. They're trying to think about risks right now and they're trying to think about what do I have to monitor as we get closer to the election itself because right now like we really don't have a ton of policy clarity so we have to start working off some assumptions to start so on biden we admittedly think it's it's more of the same going forward and you're going to have a divided house and senate if trump wins we're starting to work off of a case where we're going to have a red sweep but and i think this is the big but and this is what we're talking to clients about right now is it is not going to be the same Trump if it's a Trump presidency uh, 2.0. Why not? And <laughs> what would change in a yeah. Trump 2.0 scenario? And how would the markets react to those changes, whether it's from tariffs to spending to tax cuts? So it's a different fiscal starting point. I think that is huge when we start thinking about this going forward. And also the macro backdrop is much different. So first, like, when it comes to the fiscal, the first Trump presidency was not really fiscal negative. We think there's going to be less of a positive fiscal impulse if we see a red wave going forward. Because, look, we have seen debt as a percent of GDP spike during the pandemic and stay elevated. So there's much, much more focus on deficits going forward. So that's point number one. So point number two is everyone likes this idea of potential deregulation if we have a red wave. Admittedly, that was good the first time around. We saw that initial market pop, markets traded well, and then we stumbled into steel tariffs the first time around. I think tariffs, you know, that is the risk that we're focusing on if we see a red wave. Deregulation, it's a positive, but might be offset by some of the fiscal constraints. So there's a lot more puts and takes, and it all has to do with our starting point from a debt perspective. Well, it's worth asking too, if, if you're worried about tariffs the most, then what industries, what stocks are gonna be most impacted and how would that impact the overall indices in the event of a Trump presidency part two? Look, overall, we think that's negative for equity markets. Think how the market reacted the first time, and that was around more focused tariffs, was pretty negative. So again, if there's more of a tariff focus, that could be a broad negative for equity markets. But when it comes when it comes to sectors and industries, you know, a lot of people are going to want to point to tech as having a lot of revenue coming outside of the U.S. They're going to look at banks maybe on the other side because they're more domestically focused. But we think that's the wrong way to think about it. Hmm. Admittedly, we should be looking back at which companies did really well when supply chains were disrupted, or I should say did relatively well when supply chains were disrupted during the pandemic. And use that as a guidepost to who actually has more complicated value chains. So instead of looking at it sector by sector, we basically broke out the stocks within sectors to see who has more complicated supply chains, which could mean international sourcing. Right. And basically pin those against companies that have, you know, less diverse, less complicated supply chains, mm -hmm. more domestically oriented. Right. Drew Pettit of Citigroup, we thank you so much for your time. Looking around the corner, long way ahead, long road ahead for this election as well. Let's take a look at how markets closed on the day because it looks kind of shaky there, Scarlett, but we did end in the green with the S&P 500. It was interesting. It was not the most loved sectors typically bringing the index up today. It was materials, real estate, healthcare, but we did see some weakness in those tech stocks. We saw the NASDAQ 100 down on the day, so not a clean equity story. But we did see some relief in yields and we yes. did see a hike higher in crude on the day. Yeah, and of course, uh, there's more Fed speak uh, for everyone to fixate on in the coming days. There sure is. Let's keep an eye on those yields. We have the 10-year flirting with getting down to that 4% level, but we are certainly not there yet. This is The Close on Bloomberg.
this is the close on Bloomberg. Just to clarify something we said earlier, Amgen shares on the move right now and after hours trading, after it says it expects revenue to jump as much as 20 percent this year, thanks in large part to the purchase of Horizon Therapeutics, which uh, allowed it to get into a rare disease treatments. Uh, separately, the company is, of course, looking to be a big player in the weight loss drug industry uh, with its own products there, but the two are not necessarily connected. Uh, just to clarify there, um, again, Amgen coming out with a forecast that uh, beat analyst estimates. All right, let's go now to the top three, where we take a deep dive into the people at the center of the day's top stories. And first up, Shanali, is Adam Newman. He is the WeWork co-founder. And guess what? He's teaming up with Dan Loeb's Third Point to explore an offer to buy WeWork out of bankruptcy, according to a letter sent to WeWork's lawyers. Uh, Newman stepped down as CEO in 2019. He wanted to take the company public, didn't. He got paid off by SoftBank, and now he wants to come back and buy it? And remember, this is a shocking headline in and of itself and a twist of events. But remember, also, there's a lot of detail we don't have. We don't know how much he would pay for the company. We don't know the details of the financing. We don't know if he wants all or some of the assets. And Dan Loeb's third point, remember, which is said to have been involved in this kind of negotiation here, has said on the record that they have only had preliminary talks with Newman and the startup about this idea. You know that that TV show, We Crashed, that documented yeah. what happened with WeWork? I feel like they need to do an update here, you know, because... Their the story continues, the right? The story continues. Well, there's another story that continues. I'm watching Jack Dorsey because the former Twitter CEO and founder is expanding his new social network to everyone. Remember, this is a company, Blue Sky, that opened to the public a year ago, and it was on an invite-only basis. And it has the goal of decentralization, that is, allowing anyone to create their own social network using Blue Sky's technology protocol. Blue Sky itself claims to have about 3 million users. Mm -hmm. The reason I love this story is because Twitter and X had this idea of getting closer to the crypto world. Decentralization is a big thing for Jack Dorsey. In the meantime, like normal people, I feel like have just kind of dropped off using Twitter or X and never got an invite to Blue Sky. So, (laughs) and Threads, you know, it's kind of there, but you're not doing anything with it, or at least I'm not. We'll get you into all the clubs. Don't worry about it. (laughs) I'm waiting for my invite. All right. Saving the best for last, the biggest too. Taylor Swift, her attorneys have threatened legal action against a college student who tracks the pop star's jet use. Social media commentators, of course, have been criticizing the amount of carbon that her private jet emits. She is resuming her Eras tour in Tokyo this week. Uh, spending is estimated to total some $230 million. Breaking in the money and using the private jet. I appreciate very much the response from uh, the student himself as well mm-hmm. in the statement. He said, you should have a decent expectation that your jet will be tracked whether I do it or not. Uh, after all, it is public information. Indeed, uh, jets are private informa- uh, public you information. You are big enough that someone will track you, if not me. Yes, exactly. Like every other finance titan in the world. All right. We've got a lot <laughs> to come, a lot more to cover here. Uh, still ahead, what investors need to watch for tomorrow. There's a big earnings report tomorrow after the bell. Disney. This is The Close on Bloomberg. There was a flurry of earnings today, and it doesn't end because it's all part of the big lead up to the start of media earnings season. And Disney will be reporting tomorrow after the bell. So joining us now for a look ahead is Jessica Reef Ehrlich. She is a senior analyst for media and entertainment at Bank of America. Jessica, so good to see you. Thank you for speaking with us. There was a headline that came out earlier this hour that I want to get your thoughts on. Uh, We don't have a lot of details, but ESPN, Fox and Warner Brothers Discovery are going to be joining forces to launch a sports focused stream streaming service. What do you think we'll get from Fox and Disney when they do report tomorrow in terms of any kind of actual details? Well, hopefully more details. All we know is that it's owned a third, a third, a third. Um, Look, this has been discussed for a long time, putting sports assets together so that consumers can find the games that they're looking for. It's just so confusing, whether it's entertainment content or sports, and sports is something that's easier to put together. Um, So, you know, in that sense, it's positive, but we don't know, you know, how much, what assets are going in, how much they'll charge for the service. Is it something that would pull apart the bundle, which would be really bad for these, all three companies. So I don't think it's that. 
Um, but, you know, what, what's different about this except for, I, you know, we just, there's not a lot of detail, mm -hmm. but the concept of putting sports together is very positive. Well, it begs the question also, if you're thinking about ESPN in the scope of the Disney empire here, how important is it for them to really make more of what they have there, given the challenges they have at some other businesses? I mean, look, sports is very important to Disney. We know that they're exploring strategic investors who can either help them with distribution or content. There's been speculation the NFL is interested, maybe the NBA as well. So hopefully tomorrow they'll say something about, you know, we'll get an update. We'll see. Um, but sports is obviously a very important area for them. It feels like it's stabilizing. Yeah. Um, and so that that's one thing that, that we'll see tomorrow with the earnings. Absolutely. We'll look for that. We'll also look for any kind of improvement on Disney Plus subscriber numbers after that price increase. But I wanted to get your take on parks and recreation, the, the resorts in particular, because that's been a strong part of Disney's uh, business operations. But they have some difficult comparisons, don't they? Very tough in Orlando. I think the other parks will probably be doing very well. A little more co competitive in L.A. because Universal opened, um, you know, a, a, a new attraction. Having said that, the, the parks, this is not a huge quarter. This will not be a huge quarter because of the tough comparisons. But Disney's in a great position with their parks. They're not, you know, it's not something we're really concerned about. Uh -huh. There's a long-term growth path for them. Um, and the cruise ships will be ramping up as well, which is their highest return on invested capital. So it's a business that will grow. There's some speculation that they may announce a fifth gate at some point in Florida. They certainly have the lands to do that. Um, so that's one area where I think they're very confident will be a growth area for a decade or, you know, the coming decade. All right. So we'll watch for that. We'll watch for ESPN. Any details on this new sports streaming service? We'll watch for Disney Plus as well. Jessica, thank you so much well, for your Disney, time. You're right. Okay, thank you. No, no, wait, what were you going to say? Sorry, I cut you up. Well, I was going to say, D Disney Plus, well, this quarter, Disney Plus, they, they've already said that, you know, the first fiscal quarter, the December quarter, will not be a strong quarter gotcha. in terms of subs. But the coming quarter, they have the charter deal kicking in, which will really drive subs. And the one thing that Bob Iger has been totally focused on is is improving the cost structure of that business. So if there's a surprise on the upside tomorrow, yeah. we, we would think it would come from, from the direct-to-consumer business. All right, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your insight with us. Jessica Reef Erlich from Bank of America. I got too enthusiastic about what's coming up tomorrow, but really, I mean, we should stay with Disney because that's what's the big thing. Fox in the morning, Disney in the afternoon. Absolutely. More things during the day, though. And there's some economic data as well. We didn't have any data today, so everyone just fixated on Fed speak, but there is some data, especially on the housing market. There's certainly some NBA data. Had more Fed speak, Kugler, Collins, Barkin, and Bowman. We had a lot of mester today. Yields really came down uh, on the heels of really what Abigail Doolittle calls a haven bid here. Let's see if that sustains into the rest of the week. The message has been fairly consistent. March is probably not likely, but, you know, further into the year, maybe the Fed will gain some confidence that they can start cutting rates. All right. Let's talk about earnings. Lots and lots of earnings to talk about. Uh, Madison Square Garden Sports, and really that's the New York Knicks and the New York Rangers. Uh, Carlisle, which I know you've got your eye on as well. Yeah, absolutely. It will be almost Harvey Schwartz's first full year as CEO. Aries is also reporting soon, too. Big rival in the private credit mm -hmm. space. But you also have Spirit, Yum Brands. We have a whole tasting of the economy here. Allstate, PayPal, Mattel, and Cody. A lot to look forward to. And, of course, we know the S&P has been reacting. Yes, yes. I mean, today it did levitate a little bit higher and the moves have been fairly modest, but maybe these earnings will give uh, share prices a little bit more of a push. That does it for us. Balance of Power is up next. Have a great evening. This is The Close on Bloomberg.